Hey, HTTP. Congrats on the summit. Me and the kids will be watching from home. Hey, but we really want to do a shout out. Thank you so much for being a great organization that is looking to empower the Latinx community in tech and telecom. We root for you. COVID-19 has forced an overnight shift to an almost entirely digital way of conducting the business of everyday life, including sensitive aspects of our lives like healthcare, and with it, a call to use technology tools to track the spread of the disease through digital contact tracing. This quick development and deployment of digital tools is raising more and more questions about the security of our personal data, which has opened a unique window for bipartisan consensus on the need to establish a federal framework to protect consumer privacy nationwide. The lack of consumer privacy protections in the United States has created a pathway to unintended harms for black and brown communities. For HTTP, the establishment of a consistent policy framework to protect our sensitive data is also a call to ensure that consumer privacy is grounded in civil rights principles as a way of mitigating discriminatory harms that have led to deceptive voter suppression misinformation online, housing discrimination and digital redlining, employment discrimination, predatory lending, and the facilitation of warrantless government surveillance and policing practices. For privacy legislation to fully protect against the wide array of civil rights harms from commercial data practices, we must center the voices of communities most directly affected by those practices and work with Congress to empower the Federal Trade Commission with rulemaking authority and the funding necessary to help them regulate unfair and discriminatory data practices. I had the opportunity to sit down with FTC Commissioner Christine Wilson earlier this summer to discuss her thoughts on consumer privacy and the current and future role of the FTC in mitigating consumer harm. Thank you so much to, uh, to HTTP for, for having me today. I, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I appreciate your interest in this topic. Uh, privacy has been a significant focus of mine since the pandemic uh, began with the increasing focus on the use of health data and location data, not just in the United States, but around the world as a way of potentially containing the spread of the virus, which of course is a good thing, but there are perhaps unintended consequences. And so uh, it is a very important issue to me and I am pleased to to hear of your interest in the topic and to be here with you today uh, to, to talk about it. Of course, before I begin, I need to give you the standard disclaimer that, of course, nothing I say today is necessarily reflective of the view of the Federal Trade Commission or any other commissioner. I am speaking uh, on behalf of myself and, and myself only today. So let me begin with a brief introduction. Um, the, the Federal Trade Commission, as you probably know, has a broad consumer protection mission to combat unfair and deceptive practices, and privacy falls within this broad mission. So we use our general authority under Section 5 of the FTC Act to reach privacy, but we also enforce privacy and data security statutes for certain sectors, including uh, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which covers credit, COPPA, which covers children's privacy, Graham Leach Bliley and the Safeguards Rule, which cover financial information, and then the Health Breach Notification Rule, which covers some health providers. And for many years, the agency on a bipartisan basis has called for comprehensive federal privacy legislation to boost the jurisdiction and the authority of the FTC in the privacy and data security arena. Tech developments uh, related to COVID-19, including contact tracing and monitoring to ensure compliance with stay-at-home orders rely on sensitive health and location information, and so these developments have further underscored the need for federal privacy legislation because they've highlighted some gaps in U.S. privacy laws. Federal privacy legislation is necessary, as you said, to protect uh, key consumer protection values that are within the FTC's jurisdiction, but there are also civil liberties that are at issue. You highlighted some of them. Today, I'm going to focus most specifically on Fourth Amendment rights. There are claims uh, in public reporting that contact tracing apps have been used by law enforcement to track people for non-public health purposes, and, and we'll get into that in a bit. 
So today, uh, I want to address just a handful of topics. First, how the pandemic has underscored the privacy concerns. Second, the constitutional issues that are implicated. Third, the need for federal privacy legislation. And then in conclusion, how to mitigate some of the risks to privacy and civil liberty that we're seeing. So let me start first with the privacy, technology, and COVID-19 topic. Many governments are turning to technology to help monitor and enforce quarantines and for contact tracing to contain the disease. We've seen this at the federal, state, and local levels in the United States, but we've also seen it in a variety of countries around the world. And many are viewing technology, including comprehensive contact tracing, as key to safely easing quarantines and resuming normal life. But notably, these efforts are fueled by sensitive data regarding people's movements and their health. So one example is the Apple-Google partnership. They recently announced a contact tracing platform that has garnered global attention. Authorities have been invited to create apps for this platform, which relies on Bluetooth technology to detect proximity to other devices. And users receive alerts if they come into contact with infected individuals. Apple and Google have promised that users who share a diagnosis via the app will not have their identities disclosed to the companies or other users. The data will only be used by public health officials. Microsoft and the University of Washington have announced a contact tracing app called COVIDSafe. Using GPS location data from an infected person's phone, public health authorities can post alerts disclosing the locations visited by the person who has coronavirus. And individuals can use the app to cross-reference the location data in their own phones to determine if they were in the same location at the same time. Uh, these initiatives are new, so little is known about the kinds of information that will be collected, who will have access to it, with whom it will be shared, how long it will be retained, and a host of other questions that we would typically be interested in understanding as privacy experts. There are also really important questions about the efficacy of these apps. There are recent studies that assert contact tracing via app lacks the superior accuracy of manual tracing. Not only that, there are cautions that these apps may be subject to manipulation for nefarious purposes. And so in the end, it could be the worst of both worlds, right? You're using these technology-driven solutions that are, first of all, inferior in effectiveness to the manual contact tracing, but second of all, uh, open to being hacked or being exploited for, for nefarious purposes. In, uh, in mid-June, the National Association of Attorneys General wrote a letter to Apple and to Google expressing concerns about unofficial contact tracing apps in the App Store and the Google Play Store, which they asserted may endanger consumers' personal information. So uh, obviously, technology holds promise, but it also raises a great deal of concerns. Let me, let me touch briefly on the constitutional issues. The Fourth Amendment protects Americans from government overreach. And in the case law, there is what we call a reasonable expectation of privacy test. And so if a, if a citizen has a, a reasonable expectation of privacy in something and the government tries to seize it without a warrant, his reasonable expectation of privacy is violated and therefore the Fourth Amendment has been breached. But companies' mass data collection affects our rights under the Fourth Amendment. Consumers, of course, have grown accustomed to surrendering extensive data through their daily use of phones, computers, digital assistants, and other connected devices. And this phenomenon has inevitable spillover effects in the legal arena. In other words, if citizens know and accept that nothing is private, then they have no reasonable expectation of privacy and protections under the Fourth Amendment get eviscerated. So police have long been able to enforce the law based on direct observation of violations. But if authorities identify law violations, for example, contravening stay-at-home orders based on data collection rather than direct observation, the Fourth Amendment may be implicated. In two recent cases, the Supreme Court of the United States limited the warrantless tracking of Americans through cell phone data and GPS devices placed on their cars. 
while GPS data could help contain the spread of COVID-19, it could also be used to establish violations of stay-at-home orders. Uh, it could also be used to identify people who have attended uh, protests across the country in recent weeks. And there were rumors that, that, in fact, that data has been used in that way. And so we, at a federal, state, and local level, have uh, government entities who are grappling with, uh, with these issues and, uh, and potentially uh, implicating not just the privacy of of Americans, but also their civil liberties. Let me let me talk for a minute about current limitations in federal privacy laws. So, so we do have, as I said, broad privacy authority under Section 5 of the FTC Act, and we also focus on enforcement of specific uh, sectoral privacy laws. Uh, one of those is HIPAA. So HIPAA and other laws govern privacy rules for information that's collected by healthcare professionals and traditional public health contact tracers. But consumers are providing health data to many more entities, including Fitbit, Apple Watch, and the makers of smart thermometers. Of course, there's also low-tech data collection. As restaurants and other businesses are reopening, they're taking customers' temperatures and they're keeping track of who has visited at what times. There's a gentleman named Travis LeBanc, who is a Democrat on the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, who recently wrote a letter to Acting Secretary Chad Wolf uh, of DHS, and, and he wrote to express concerns about plans to check airline passengers' temperatures before they boarded the flight. He said the pandemic is not a hall pass to disregard the privacy and civil liberties of the traveling public. And I would expand on what Travis said. The pandemic is not a hall pass to disregard the privacy and civil liberties of the public in any way, shape, or form, regardless of whether they are traveling or pursuing other activities. So the FTC has has long used this broad consumer protection authority that I've referenced to safeguard Americans' privacy and data security, but its specific privacy authority is limited, and there is no general privacy law that covers every company that collects data on folks in the United States. So I have called on Congress to pass federal privacy legislation that would provide more transparency to consumers and greater certainty to businesses about the types of data that can be collected and how those data can be used and shared. With established legal boundaries, companies would be better equipped to determine when the government is asking them to cross the line for the public good, if they are being asked to share information with the government or with researchers who in turn would share reports with the government, and also whether those companies should require a subpoena or inform customers before turning over data. Since the pandemic began, there have been a number of bills introduced, one by Republicans, one by Democrats, and one on a bipartisan basis that would require companies to get affirmative express consent before collecting COVID-19 data. These bills do agree on some issues, including the need to uh, obtain affirmative express consent rather than infer consent from inaction the obligation to provide an effective way to revoke consent, and enforcement by the FTC under its authority against unfair or deceptive practices and by state attorneys general. But the proposals diverge on some of the same points that unfortunately previously held up passage of a baseline privacy law, whether the federal law preempts state law, for example, and whether consumers should have a private right of action to, to obtain damages and whether this right can be subject to binding arbitration. Regardless of which bill is adopted, voluntary measures will fail if a critical mass of Americans don't participate. In other words, if there is no digital trust which should incentivize both the public and private sectors to demonstrate their trustworthiness. And a narrow privacy bill dealing only with the conditions of the pandemic, personally, I think, is far less preferable than comparable, comprehensive legislation that will provide broad guidance for years to come. Facebook is a place where more than a billion people worldwide come to share their thoughts and feelings. 
Our systems catch many things like porn and spam before most people even see them. But we also encourage our community to confidentially report things they think violate our standards. People send us millions of reports like this each week. Automation helps us prioritize the ones that go to our team of human reviewers who work 24 seven in over 40 languages across the globe. Their job is to carefully review reports against our community standards. After examining the issue with language and cultural context in mind, they make a decision, usually within 24 hours, though matters of urgent safety come first. Through this process, violating posts are removed on an ongoing basis. And we're constantly improving to give you more control over what you see, helping us to make Facebook a more safe and welcoming place for everyone. Find out more at facebook.com slash community standards.